Brothers and sisters, we had the opportunity this week to work with children from all around our community. Some who go to other churches, yes, but a few who were unchurched. And what a blessing that we had to bring the good news, the message of Jesus into the lives and the homes of these young people. It's fascinating to me as I reflect on the past week that there are families who will bring their children to a vacation Bible school, but when it comes to attending church on Sunday, <laughs> there seems to be a resistance there. You see, the perception of going to church or becoming a member of a church has changed a lot in the past couple of generations. And I think a lot of that has to do with how people perceive us as Christians. Ask 100 non-church attending non-Christians what they think of the Christian world. And according to a study that was conducted by the Fermi Institute, which is a fairly reputable Christian research organization, 87 out of 100 people perceive Christians as judgmental and hypocritical. 87% of non-Christians polled. We have a public image problem, brothers and sisters. An alarming number of people, even those who are receptive to Jesus' message, are reluctant to affiliate with a church or even call themselves Christians. And yes, part of the problem is their own sin nature. And part of the problem is the adversary trying to drive a wedge between God and his people. But part of the problem is us. I feel that many Christians fail to understand the nature of judgment as God defines it and defines our role in it. And as a result, the kinds of judgmentalism and hypocrisy that those 87% are talking about turn people off to Jesus' message, push them away from our churches instead of pulling them in. And some of it has to do with the habits that we fall into as Christians and our misunderstandings of how we are to judge and interact with other people. Yes, part of that is our own sin nature and the adversary going to work on us, but some of it just has to do with a lack of understanding on our part of what the Bible teaches us and how the Bible teaches us to view and, yes, judge others. Now, a few months ago when we tackled the Sabbath day issue, I told you that periodically I would be doing a sermon in the series called Prepared to Give an Answer to equip you all to answer those objections and those questions that we encounter as we witness to people. So I've chosen this topic for this series because as our church had this wonderful opportunity this past week to serve our community and its youth and by extension their families, I think it's absolutely essential that we all be prepared for those objections that we might meet in witnessing to those families and encouraging them to get to church. Even if it's not our church, just to get to church. Of course, we'd love to see them here. So rather than beginning with the standard, judge not lest you be judged, today I'm going to start us out with an example of how Jesus taught us to judge. What right judgment looks like. Then we're going to go reference by reference through the difference between not just judgment and discernment, which is a lot of times what we'll respond to people as. We're not supposed to judge, but we're supposed to discern, which is true. But we're going to talk about the difference between judgmentalism and right judgment. 
So let's turn to Matthew 10. We'll read verses 11 through 16. This is Jesus sending his disciples out into the world to preach the gospel. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 11, Now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So we have here Jesus sending out his disciples to perform signs and wonders and to proclaim the gospel to all the people, the good news of Jesus. And clearly, from this passage, we see that Jesus wants them to judge. If the household is worthy, he says. The Greek is axia, which means of value or having merit. It's clearly a judgment. The disciples were to then bless them if they were axia, if they were worthy. The blessing of peace is specifically referenced in Hebrew. That's shalom. We've talked about that word, that importance and the significance of that blessing. Shalom, peace. And Jesus gives his disciples the context of how to determine the worthiness, the value of the homes and the people they visited. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words. There's a distinction here that stabs right to the heart of that perception of Christians as judgmental. Jesus is telling his disciples to judge the worthiness of their audience, yes, but he's telling them to judge it by their willingness to receive the gospel, by their outward acceptance or refusal of the gospel message. And according to Jesus' instructions, his disciples would then know how to proceed. Once they'd made that judgment, they'd know exactly what to do next, right? What Jesus told them to do next was to call them heathens, to scorn them, persecute them for their rejection of the gospel, badmouth them on social media, use derogatory names to further shame them, and publicly declare their unworthiness to the whole world. Oh, wait. No. <laughs> Hold on. I might have read that wrong. No. He said move on. He said shake off the dust from your feet. More on that in just a moment. How many Christians do we see doing the very things that I just listed? Calling groups or people by derogatory names. Posting on Facebook how a certain group or a certain person is going to hell. Even calling one another out for their sinful ways in public, among the church, or behind their backs to one another. That's called gossip, slander, backbiting judgmentalism. It's interesting, judgmentalism is actually not a word in English, but we all know what I'm talking about when I say it. It's been added now to the Oxford Dictionary, so now it's official. <laughs> How do those behaviors witness to the world, brothers and sisters? Is it any wonder that people have grown to this perception of Christians as hypocritical and judgmental? as snarky, judgy McJudgepants people. <laughs> we are commanded to discern. But we are also commanded to never become a stumbling block. And it seems like the church has become a stumbling block factory. <laughs> we are not to 
because of our actions, turn off anyone that might be fertile ground for the seed of the gospel. Friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't get to judge someone's heart. We don't get to judge the state of someone's ability to be saved. That's God's job. We don't know, nor do we get to judge what's going on inside of them. John 12, 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word <laughs> Technical difficulties. John 12, 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Not you, not me, the word. We can certainly, as Christians, and we are called as Christians to recognize the outward signs that someone is in conflict with God. We are to judge that. But when it comes to the actual judgment of the thoughts and intents of the heart of the person, that's God's wheelhouse. 1 Peter 4, 5. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Not to us, but to him who is ready to judge. And it is by the measuring stick of his word that that judgment will take place. That measures our lives, that measures our thoughts and the intents of our hearts. It's a good one in Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. It's to him, brothers and sisters, that we must give an account. Not each other. So we don't get to judge each other's salvation. We also don't get to judge what's in each other's hearts, but we are to call each other out on our actions. Jesus, who was the only man qualified to and able to know the intents of the hearts of the people, the only one with a right to judge the salvation of anyone, still set the example for us of the right way to handle our judgments. In John 4, Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman at the well. He comments on the outward circumstances of her life. The fact that she'd had five husbands and was now in a non-marriage relationship of some kind. But he does not judge the woman herself. Instead, Jesus sees the circumstances of her life as an opportunity to teach, to give her the good news of the gospel, to proclaim his message of hope and redemption. I'm going to pause here for a little teaching moment because we as a biblical church, I believe that when we come across common misunderstandings in scripture, I feel it's important that we address them. So I'm going to diverge a little bit here. Many in the Christian world see the woman at the well as a harlot. Five husbands, now she's living with some guy, having some kind of illicit affair. 
So the message that a lot of Christians take away from the passages uh, in John 4 is that a sexually immoral woman can still receive the gospel, which is true, by the way, but not at all the point of this story. I cannot tell you how important proper biblical study is. You see, in Jesus' day, a woman could not request a divorce from her husband. She just couldn't do it. So the fact that this woman had been divorced or widowed five times did not mean that she was indiscriminate in her relationships or didn't take her marriage vows seriously. Chances are her husbands had either died or they had left her. The fact that she was with a man who wasn't her husband, as Jesus comments on, doesn't necessarily mean illicit affair. It's quite possible that she was some sort of concubine, which was an accepted practice. In fact, God himself gives certain rules for that relationship in the Old Testament. So as a five-time widow or divorcee, whichever, the woman at the well was likely a beggar. Because you see, women didn't have any rights to their husband's property when their husband died or left them. They didn't get 50% of everything. They got nothing. Five times through, chances are she was impoverished. She was a beggar. But she shows her own inner strength by her unconventional being at the well at midday. That was an uncommon thing, especially for a Samaritan woman her precocious questioning of Jesus' teachings. It's actually my favorite part of her personality from the little we know about her. She wasn't afraid to ask why and show me and tell me. And by her boldness, going into the town and saying, hey, there's this guy at the well. Here's what he's teaching. What do we do? I think that all shows that her nature was not that of an unrepentant sinner or harlot, as so many, of, many think of her, but rather as a struggling sinner just like you and me, whose life was transformed by Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And she became a preacher of Jesus. She went into the town and brought the people to Jesus. So that in John 4.42, we read, Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now I spent that few minutes of diversion in biblical exegesis because this is a sermon about judgmentalism. How many thousands of Christians for how many hundreds of years have been judgmental of the woman at the well? Drawn conclusions about her nature. It doesn't. It doesn't say harlot. Mm -hmm. It does. But she's not called one. But yet people jump to the, oh, five husbands? Kinda, what kind of person is this? We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. And Jesus, who could judge, the only one of us who could, didn't. Instead, he saw it as an opportunity to preach to her, to bring her to him, and not just her. Another great example that the Lord and Savior showed us in Scripture of how we are to judge is just a few chapters later in John 8. Jesus refuses to condemn the adulteress that the Pharisees had brought before him. Jesus, in fact, calls them out on their hypocrisy, challenging whichever one of them had no sin in his life to go ahead and throw that first stone. John 8, verses 10 and 11. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. 
Jesus didn't judge her heart. And he didn't withhold salvation just because she was an adulteress. He loved these women. He acknowledged and judged the wrongness of their actions. But he still saw in them the worth, the worthiness of the gospel. And that's the worth that he told his disciples to look for in our main reading today when he sent them out to preach the word of God. So let me go back to our reading in Matthew for just a moment. Jesus instructed his disciples to judge the worthiness, which, a.k.a. willingness, of each household to receive his message. But as I pointed out earlier, he didn't instruct the disciples to then rail against them if they didn't or be mean to them. He simply said, shake off the dust of your feet. What does that mean? It sounds like a significant thing. I've heard speculation in some places that the shaking off of the dust of the feet is some kind of significant ritual that involves some kind of curse. Again, can I stress for just a moment how important it is to study the Bible in its entirety, <laughs> proper biblical study, in the cultural history and the context that it was intended. In Jewish culture, and in fact, in that day, not just Jewish culture, in many cultures, the shaking off the dust of your feet was a common idiom. They used it exactly the same way we use a common idiom in English today. I wash my hands of it. Same exact expression. I'm done with it. I wash my hands of the matter. You see, in Matthew, we read that God will take care of the judging, ultimately. That if people reject the gospel outright, it would be better to have lived in Sodom or Gomorrah than in the city they live in. Yikes. God will take care of that part. We don't need to punish. God's got it. That's right. <laughs> VBS, we had a song where the kids got to shout, God's got it. The act itself of shaking off the dust of your feet was simply a way of saying, I've done everything I can do. I tried to share the message. I gave them the opportunity. That's our responsibility as Christians. If they won't receive it, at some point there's nothing we can do. It's between them and God then. Paul and Barabbas actually did the act of shaking the dust off their feet. In Antioch, it was a public display. They did it intentionally and publicly shaking off the dust from their sandals at the leaders of Antioch who were casting them out and threatening them their lives. And they did it kind of as a public display of warning. Hey, we tried. We're dusting, we're knocking dust off our sandals now. It's between you and God. That does give some significance to the phrase and people's perception of it as a pretty significant thing. If you've got God's messenger preaching the word to you and you reject it, them shaking the dust off their feet, probably not a good thing for you. <laughs> Time to wake up. That's right. But you see, Paul and Barabbas didn't stick around and then throw their sandals at people or call them names or ridicule them. They gave them a warning. Hey, we're leaving. We're shaking dust off. And then they left it between Antioch and God. Yes, Paul and Barabbas judged they judged the people as not receptive to God's word. They judged them by their actions. So let's talk about the elephant in the middle of the room, because I know at least some of you are thinking it. We all know the verse, Matthew 7, 1. Judge not, lest ye be judged. That verse, in fact, is a favorite of non-Christians when talking about Christians, when talking about Christian hypocrisy. And by the way, plenty of Christians are guilty of hypocrisy, just not in the way that the non-Christians use this verse to show it. So let's read Matthew 7, 1, but let's read it in the entire context. Matthew 7, verses 1 through 6. 
judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. See, says the non-Christian, it says right there, judge not. No, actually, it doesn't. Yes, it uses the words, judge not. But you've got to read scripture in context of scripture. It is clearly talking about judging others when you yourself are doing the same things or worse that you're judging them for. These passages are clearly about hypocrisy. And anyone who disagrees with that interpretation needs to come and explain to me then how verse 6 fits with this whole passage. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't give your things that are holy to the dogs. Jesus is not talking about real animals here. Jesus is clearly teaching his disciples that they should judge to whom they give the message. And we've talked about the measuring stick he gave them. Jesus also gives us what it's important to judge. A few verses later in Matthew 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So one of the things we are to judge then is the teachings, the words coming out of their mouths. We can judge the actions. We can judge the teachings. Not the hearts, not their status of their salvation with God, but their teachings and their actions. But we'd better make sure our own personal inventory is in order when we do it. Better make sure there aren't any two-by-fours sticking out of our own eye. In our reading in Matthew 10, Jesus sends us out as gentle, loving sheep. Not hate-mongering, bashing attackers of those who don't see the truth of the gospel. He sends us out as loving sheep into a world full of wolves. So yeah, we have to judge Jesus absolutely expects us to judge. He just said it. We just read it. He expects us to be as wise as serpents. We need to discern and judge right from wrong the actions of other people. But we have to do it in the gentle spirit of the dove. In between those last two references in Matthew 7 that I gave you, we find the spirit of how judgment should manifest. The part I think that's missing from how most Christians go about judging, which is why people have such a perception issue with the Christian church today. This is what's missing, I think, from the Christian approach, and its absence is the reason for the 87% that we talked about at the beginning. Matthew 7, 12, you know it as the golden rule. Therefore, Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Yes, brothers and sisters, we are called to discern. In fact, God expects us to know right from wrong and stand lovingly for what is right always, firmly and lovingly. But we are to treat those we judge the way we would want to be treated when we are judged. 
Isn't it interesting that the golden rule, which so many people use just as a standalone verse, as a standalone principle, but look at where it occurs in the Bible. It's right smack dab in the middle of passages concerning judgment. How we judge each other and other people. God commands us to judge, but judge rightly. John 7, 24. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. That doesn't give us an excuse to break the golden rule. That wouldn't be righteous judgment. We're not going to sway people from the error of their ways if we're being judgmental and hypocritical. We are commanded to build each other up, not tear each other down, not bring people down with judgmentalism. Ephesians 4.29, important one to remember. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Name-calling, derogatory speech, hatred, negative posts on social media. These tear down. They don't edify. They don't build up. Especially when we're doing them to one another as believers. And take that one step further. When the outside world, when the unsaved see us doing that to each other. Because frankly, when it comes to the unsaved, we sh really shouldn't be judging them anyway. Think about that. We can judge from their outward actions whether or not they're in relationship with Jesus Christ, but it pretty much ends there. There's not much more we would need to judge once we know that they're unsaved. But once we know that they're unsaved, we have a responsibility. What is that? <laughs> to offer them salvation. You know, we're not going to change their hearts. We're not going to change their minds. We can be a stumbling block in the way of them accepting that message. That's the point of this sermon. That's what we need to be equipped not to do. We can plant the seed. We can do all that we've been commanded to do, and that's all we can do. We can't change their hearts. So we shouldn't be judging their hearts. We preach to them if they're receptive. That's what we were told. Preach to them if they're receptive, if they're not, or if they're hostile. We don't need to get in their faces. Shake the dust off our feet. We move on. We've done all that we're required by God to do. Paul, when he admonished the church in Corinth about sexual immorality, really drove home the point. 1 Corinthians 5.12. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside, meaning outside the church? Do you not judge those who are inside? Let's take care of each other. Let's take care of ourselves. We don't need to worry about judging others other than proclaiming the message. We don't need to save where we don't need to judge the outsiders, Paul is clearly saying, but in the same passion, there's that obvious admonition that, you know what, brothers and sisters, we do judge each other. I've seen contention in churches over that issue. As Christians, we do judge one another. How do we do that? Hopefully the right way. Paul goes on to make that point and drive it home that even in worldly matters, we should be dealing with them ourselves, among ourselves, in the right spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 3, Paul says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous? In other words, you have a problem with a fellow Christian, are you really going to take that to the worldly courts? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the small matters, the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more than 
things that pertain to this life. Clearly, spiritually mature Christians are going to judge. In fact, we're exhorted to. But there's the old Christian adage. You've all heard it. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Okay? It's a little trite, but it's true. We don't get to judge each other's hearts either. We don't get to judge how God feels about someone else. Instead, as we've learned today, we can do these things. One, test everything in our own life against God's word. Make sure our own house is in order. Repent of any sin or any planks in our own eyes. Two, by judging our own, then we can turn our attention to others' actions by the way they are living their lives. First, we can look to see if they are receptive to God's word. Second, if they're believers, we can help them through our judgment. If the purpose of our judgment is to restore them to God's ways. That's critical. If the reason we're judging is to lovingly bring them back into right relationship with God, then we're on the right track. If our motivation is anything other than that, we have planks in our own eyes. We have repenting to do. We are called to judge so that we can help bring people to salvation, to right relationship with Jesus. David's repentance in Psalm 51, I shared with you a few weeks ago, gives us a really good example of both how and why we judge. Psalm 51, verses 10 through 13. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. We judge in order to restore first ourselves. First, we judge ourselves in our own internal state. Then to restore other people to Jesus in the spirit of God's love. If you remember nothing else from today's sermon, remember that. We are to judge, yes, but the purpose of that judgment is not to condemn, but to bring or restore people to a relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name I close us today. Amen. Call the word.